Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are Project 440. Uh, my name is uh, Susanna Lowy, and I'm the program director and one of the lead teaching artists for Project 440. I kind of just wanted to start by introducing myself. Um, I've realized lately that one of the hardest questions that I have to regularly answer is, what do you do? And so the simple answer is, I'm a flutist, I'm a musician. But then you inevitably get the look back at you and, OK, but what do you do, right? And so that's where it gets kind of tough, because I could start listing the litany of different organizations on my business card and what I do for that one and what I play for this group. But then you get the glazed over look on their eyes, and they really didn't want all of that information. Because what they really want to hear is that I play regularly with the Philadelphia Orchestra, or the ballet, or the opera, or any number of ensembles in the Greater Philadelphia Orchestra. And the terms substitute flutist or freelance musician make them uncomfortable. And that's understandable, because it kind of makes me uncomfortable, too. And so that's the narrative that we're trying to change at Project 440. Because, of course, the symphonic model of a musician is important, but we also want the musical ideas and heroes beyond the concert hall. Because when we talk about a pipeline or a pathway, if we don't have anything at the top, then we don't have anything at all. We want our stu students to feel a responsibility of citizenship through their artistry. And you know, the campfire rule is that you leave a space better than how you found it. As Yo-Yo Ma so eloquently described in his 2013 speech on Na at the Nancy B. Hanks lecture of, on arts and public policy, the edge effect is the rampant diversity and growth that results from the intersection of where two ecosystems merge. So we want our Project 440 students to live by the campfire rule by exploring the edge effect through music so that whatever they decide to do when they grow up, they have the skills they need to be responsible and musically minded 21st century citizens. So now with that little introduction, I'm gonna pass it along to my two uh, co-panelists and then we'll start the presentation. Hi, I'm Joseph Conyers. If you're at the session before, you, I might look familiar. Uh, I'm a, <laughs> uh, the executive director of Project 440. Um, I'm very excited about that. I'm also the assistant principal double bass of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh, I conduct the All City Orchestra of the School District of Phil Philadelphia, which are the top performing students of the School District of Philadelphia. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Bryan. I am a proud board member for Project 440. I also am a board member for the Philadelphia Cultural Fund, which um, those of you who were here at the last session when we talked about, uh, a gentleman asked a question about equity and funding. And I bring this up about the Philadelphia Cultural Fund because they are, or we are, uh, in Philadelphia, technically the most equitable arts funder. We give general operating grants uh, to organizations practically of any size, and you can be fiscally sponsored the whole nine. Um, and it's the only place, uh, funding-wise, in the city that has that kind of claim when it comes to the arts and culture sector. So we support large nonprofits, we support really small initiatives that are uh, kicking up, uh, and it's a, a joy and an honor to serve on that board. Um, my life is split in a couple different areas. I have an arts background, theater, uh, uh, performing arts high school, did theater professionally, went into college, did jazz, uh, vocal performance um, as my undergrad, and then got involved with public health uh, through art making down in Miami-Dade County. Believe it or not, I was working with uh, migrant farm working populations down there. Um, and it was a, the most eye-opening experience at 22. I went there two weeks after graduating from college. Fascinating. Uh, and then kept that throughout my 20s. Ended up getting involved in a lot of the entrepreneurship um, activities, opportunities available to creatives who get involved in other sectors. And that's a huge reason why Project 440 uh, attracted me to it. They were doing some cool work. I knew Joseph. And yeah, I'll talk more about that in the context of why we developed this program and why, as a board member, I stepped in to co-create this with Susanna. And we thought back and forth about both the experience you heard from her and then the kind of experiences that I've had. Uh, in general, so thanks for being here. So I, um, as I said, I'm, as you heard me say, I'm the assistant principal bass of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and for a lot of musicians, um, that would be like, I've made it. That's the top of my career, I am done, I'm finished, 
Uh, I will play the bass for the rest of my life, and I'm going to go and play concerts, and that would be that. Um, strangely enough for me, winning my job was just, I felt like the beginning, for me, uh, um, the beginning of kind of like a whole new life and a whole new opportunity. Um, because now I, was, I had the, this position, but now I had a platform to reach out and help other people. So to dig into a little bit about the work of Project 40 and why we do the work before we get to the who we are. Um, I'm going to show you just a really, really very famous pre slide. I'm sure everyone has seen this in the room. We're all familiar with this. Now, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. You have the, the, the three individuals standing on boxes um, for equality. They each have one box, equity. Um, they have different boxes, but their heads are at the same level. Now, I um, actually got into an argument with one of my colleagues here. It was here at Sphinx, actually. And um, because we were talking about, well, what happened to the guy on the end? He had to give his box to the uh, other little per uh, to the um, person on the um, on the end who uh, couldn't see. And I um, uh, contend that he did not have to give his box away because if you look, this person does not need a box at all. Instead, uh, this person just needed a little more boost to be at the same level and see at the same level. And for me, uh, and for us in our work, we feel that music and the arts can be those boxes. Um, and the stool, tools and things that young people learn through music can help create that equity um, that exists in the world. And I say this as a musician who plays music all the time, and I'd love to talk to kids about um, uh, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms all the time, and I'll get into that in a second. But uh, how we can use music as a tool, and that goes into the heart of what Project 440 is. So we are a unique organization that we are a music organization that does not teach music. I'll repeat that. We are a music organization that does not teach music. We use music as a tool to teach entrepreneurship, leadership, and service. We also have college and career disciplines within our curriculum. And what we've done is develop an entire curriculum to help high school students in an after school program to be able to uh, realize all of this wonderful potential. And we're excited about this work. So and that is our mission on the screen. Project 40 engages, educates, and inspires young musicians by providing them with the career and life skills they need to develop into more civic-minded and entrepreneurial leaders. So why Project for 40? Well, a lot of people get us confused because I play in the Philadelphia Orchestra and they say, well, it must be a classical music organization. We are not just a classical musical, musical organization. We actually involve all genres in our work. I am excited about this because honestly, just speaking with my Joe Conyers hat on, I think there's a lot of opportunity for our, some of our symphonic institutions to uh, create some interconnectivity with other disciplines and genres. And we love to get that conversation started with young people, so for them, it's not a strange concept. Um, so we're really excited about uh, uh, that work. We, um, our beliefs, we, we have two programs that you'll hear, two main programs that you hear about um, shortly, but we are not one to say that we're gonna use Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms uh, to quote, unquote, save our children. Because to be honest, most of the kids that we're trying to reach don't care about Bach, Beethoven, or Brahms. And I say this as someone who loves Brahms. He's my favorite composer. In our work, we do community engagement work. And one of the major things we talk about is finding an entry point. What is an entry point that we can connect with an individual where they are in their life experiences. Um, it could be the music, it could be the genre of the music, it could be an experience, it could be all kinds of things. But meeting young people where they are to then introduce them to music. I love music and honestly my goal is that through a program like Project for 40, we could create a narrative on why every young person should have music in their life. Um, and by default, those young people will learn about Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. They might mix in a little Beyonce, um, <laughs> in with the mix. And we're excited about, about the opportunities. Um, uh, a lot of people say that, oh, classical music is dying, the days are over, yada, yada, yada. I think the most exciting days of our industry could very well lie before us. And that's the, uh, what we instill in, in our students. So, Dr. Lowy, please. 
Hi, so as program director and lead teaching artist of Project 440, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our programs. Um, we have three pillars of our programming. We have Instruments for Success, which targets 11th and 12th graders, to, and we share information about college and career prep all through the lens of music. So the students learn about scholarships for students that can um, play instruments, not necessarily because they're gonna major in music in college, but just because they can play, they can get scholarships to certain colleges, general FAFSA ed and application information, and advice about auditioning and recording. This course is 10 weeks and is offered twice a year. Um, and then we also have our college fair. Uh, last year, 46 colleges from around the country came from Juilliard and the Cleveland Institute of Music, San Francisco Conservatory, and then also colleges in the Philadelphia area like Temple and TCNJ and Westmi Westminster Choir College. We had over 300 attendees from the greater Philadelphia area. This includes students from the Philadelphia School District and also students um, from more rural areas that also don't necessarily get opportunities and information from colleges. Then I skipped over doing good because that's what we're gonna emphasize today. So our doing good program, um, we call it Entrepreneurial Musicians Making a Difference. So we have a complete 30 week text sorry, 30-week curriculum that is framed off, off of a text written for the course by Dr. Mark Rabideau, who uh, teaches at DePaul University. Um, and so it covers everything from um, an artist statement development. So the first thing the students do is figure out how they want to use their art to change the world. And so that's kind of like a corny introduction, like how are you going to change the world? But even from that very first week when they're trying to s figure out what difference they want to see in their communities and how they could do that through music, you see this light in their eyes. Once they put it into one sentence, it's like you couldn't stop them if you tried. Um, then within that, they're also looking at what their community needs. Um, so again, this is just what Joe said, it's finding the entry point. So you can think of that as a performance technique, an interactive performance technique, but it's also a community outreach technique in general, right? That you are figuring out what the community needs and then giving it to them through your art. The course also includes leadership training and evaluation, so, um, but it's self-evaluation. So the students are discovering what skills they have to be a good leader and that there's not just one kind of good leader, that you can be an introvert and still lead. Um, you don't have to be someone that's gonna be comfortable commanding a board meeting, um, but you can still be a very effective and beneficial leader. Um, and then entrepreneurial skill set development. So everything from creating a budget, understanding what a mission and vision is, understanding the difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit and all the different categories within that. Um, and it, the first 15 weeks culminates with the students giving a shark tank like we were calling it a dolphin tank because it's actually very kind. We're not trying to like eat the students alive. Um, but um, so it's, they, they give a five minute project pitch and then industry professionals offer advice and feedback to the projects, uh, the project groups. And then the students have the next 15 weeks of the course to actualize their programs. So it's not just based in ideation, the entire course is that the students actually bring their projects to fruition. Um, they are given 500, each group is given $500 seed funding. If they wanna use that $500 and capitalize on it and make more money, they can, or they can keep their budgets within $500. Now, they're not given any money until they show a budget and how they're gonna use the money, so it's not just a $500 check. Um, so even from that very starting point of the projects, they're expected to be able to create uh, a budget that is approved. Now, I skipped over the first bullet point that says stipend based um, because I wanted to wait until the kind of I summarized doing good to explain about it. All of our programs at Project 440, or sorry, Instruments for Success and Doing Good, the students are actually paid to come to class. They're paid $11 an hour for each hour they're in class and for one hour of homework a week. So they can earn up to $33 for a week for being in our Doing Good program. Uh, over 30 weeks, that comes to $1,000. So 
the reason we do this is not because we're trying to bribe the students, although it helps, <laughs> um, but because we don't want any of our students to feel like they can't come to our programming because they need to instead have an after school job. Being in class is their job. And I've even heard a student answer the phone and say, I'm sorry, I can't talk right now, I'm at work. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, you're at work, that's right. <laughs> um, so both Instruments for Success and this Doing Good program, um, we are able to offer our students um, a pretty good part-time job rate. So, at the end of the course, each of the groups, after they've created their project and whatever their project was, they've completed it. We have a graduation and a project showcase and it's open to their parents and friends. Um, and last year, it really turned into an extremely meaningful event where you, we got to see friends and family that had no idea what their students were up to all of a sudden, like their eyes are open, they're like, my kid did this. Um, so it's, it's a pretty great event, a uh, way to finish out the year. We also offer continued project support if they want to not just let their projects finish after the uh, doing good course. We are not currently fiscal sponsors, but we do provide advice about how to find fiscal sponsorship. And we're happy to continue mentoring the groups uh, through the next years. So some of last year's students uh, created something called Generation Music, and we have somebody here, Miss Chloe, who created uh, Generation Music. Well, Generation Music, their social need that they saw, and I think we can all agree, they wanted more diversity in the concert hall. And so they thought, well, what can we do as high school students to create the possibility of more diversity in the concert hall? So they wanted to get more young students interested in classical music. So they developed a presentation about why classical music is interesting and fun, and they bring it into elementary and middle school classrooms. They've won nationwide competitions on, uh, with this project, and they've continued it, and they even enrolled in the Doing Good course again in order to uh, further their program. Another one of last year's, yes, absolutely. And uh, to be able to get donations, they uh, got uh, approved by Fractured Atlas, uh, you know, which is a fiscal sponsor. So they are, um, they are able to accept nonprofit donations, which is pretty awesome. So do talk to Chloe if you are yeah. looking to invest. <laughs> I'm sure she has a business card. Um, <laughs> so um, we, another project from last year was the Center City Chamber Orchestra. And if you were here in the last session, you saw Marquise. He was one of the students that created the Center City Chamber Orchestra. Their need was that they wanted to provide more opportunities for students across Philadelphia to come together to make music. They felt like the musical opportunities in Philadelphia were kind of divided according to what group you belong to. So they are a, an orchestra organized by youth, led by youth, and performed by youth. So the conductor, the students, and the administrators are all in high school and just started college, which is pretty awesome. They just put on their second concert. They did one during the course, uh, the Doing Good course last year, and they just put on their second concert over the winter break to a completely full church. You know how many of us would love to have a church full of people for our performances? It's pretty awesome. They understood the power of youth and what they could bring just because they're young and had that like, hey, we're young, we're cute, we're doing this, and they like capitalized on it. They knew exactly what they're doing and they did a great job. This year, we have our developing projects. Actually, let's see, next Thursday is our shark tank back in Philadelphia or our dolphin tank. So one of the projects uh, decided they wanted to promote literacy. So this has nothing to do with music, right? They thought that we needed increased literacy. So what they are doing is they're creating an interactive performance where a donated book is the cost of admission, and the books are gathered and are donated to schools and after-school programs and libraries that need more books. So this is their idea they came, out with, came up with out of nowhere, you know? It's just like all of a sudden these ideas are out in the world and they're gonna be actualized. By the end of the year, well, that concert will happen. Um, let's see, so we also have 
a three-day residency model. So um, this residency model is completely malleable according to the needs of the organization, and there's some information across the front of the stage if you want to pick it up after or if you happen to pick it up beforehand. Um, and so what the three-day model does is it touches on all of the important aspects uh, that the students learn in the 30-week course um, over three days, and it culminates in a mini shark tank. So I'm happy to answer any questions about the curriculum and programming, about doing good or instruments for success or anything else. Um, but first I want to allow Michael O'Brien to speak about the ide ideation behind the course as a Project 440 board member and also a former lead teaching artist. So yeah, um, apologies on this. Susanna is a wonderful teacher administrator. She put together beautiful slides. Mine were sized differently, so they're a little bit smaller. And so that's not her fault. That's my fault. Um, you know, one of the things, I'm actually going to kick off this little ideation piece by bringing up another project that uh, took place um, during the first year. Um, I'll bring up two briefly. Uh, so there was one group that discovered they had this unanimous dislike for practice. And I said, that I, I was like, yes, actually, I love that, because that is such a common problem for so many people, right? Because if you think about entrepreneurship, we're always solving problems, right? I, I would always tell the young folks, entrepreneurship is about solving problems with limited resources, including time, personnel, funding, blah, 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 right? But you still got to solve your problems, or these problems. Um, and so it was interesting, right, because that conversation got them talking about how many ways they could use music outside of classical music and potentially digital platforms to look at models, say, like Suzuki or whatever, that has these really fundamental ways to get people uh, through practice to pick up like the basic, basic skills, right? That young people, if they don't practice, are gonna miss, right? So they started thinking about all these creative ways, started thinking about digital apps. I mean, the whole thing just grew for them into a really concrete idea that we then had to scale back to get to what we would consider a proof of concept, right? Or a minimal viable product, right? You gotta get a small version of this idea up tested to see if it could work, get feedback, right? So it might fail, but you're still gonna learn a lot and then you're gonna iterate again, right? And they really dug into that and I thought that was fascinating because they're learning so much by this common source of a dislike for practice, right? The other project was centered around young people having a lack of access to a number of programs in a number of fields outside of just arts and culture. There's a lack of understanding of where they're at, a lack of access to get to them in terms of transportation. They actually identified, I'd probably, what, like 15 needs. And we were like, okay, we got, let's try to solve for one, maybe two, but like 15's too much. But we were able to whittle through this with them and figure out a way for them, or they really figured out the way with our coaching to get to a place where they were like, you know what, boom, we actually can solve for like five or six of these needs by doing this one thing. And so they were, the idea, the larger idea than scaling back, I'll explain the scale back in two seconds, but the larger idea was, what if we toured high schools with young musicians and musicians who are really popular on social media locally in Philly, um, and maybe even outside of Philly, but we tour schools and bring the programs kind of like vendor uh, fair style out there along to every school. So the kids are hearing things they like, they're more enticed to come, and the programs are meeting them where they're at, right? And they were like, yo, we can tour the country with this. And I was like, all right, cool. Scale it back, proof of concept. How are we going to make this work, right? And so I bring those two examples up because some of the thoughts behind why and where this ideation came from. What you're looking at, I'm going to get a little sciencey on you for two seconds, but trust me, I'm really good at science and simple language, so just follow me. What you're looking at here is nested systems theory. Humans develop in systems that are embedded within systems that are embedded in other systems. And there are stories, needs, problems, et cetera, at all of those systems. And because they're not independent systems, needs collide. So this is even one of the reasons why, as a board member, I, I think I might have been one of the early vocal annoyances pushing for stipends. Like, man, we are asking young people to dichotomize themselves when they walk into our spaces and places. 
if they need work, if they need a job, many folks in this room were subsidized, I believe it was during the Nixon administration, to work in arts and culture when you were a teenager. That's no longer a thing that's available for us. Well, as of 2014, the government did something quite remarkable, and they did put money back into a space for young people to have apprenticeships very early, starting at 14. And there's all this money earmarked through an initiative called WIOA. Please check it out. It's the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act, and it is wide, and it includes entrepreneurship in that place. But it's because of this pressing need for young people to not have to split off their ideas around their mental health, their economic well-being, their physical health, that's not how we are built. We are built to actually think much more holistically like this uh, diagram that I had a, a graphic designer of mine put together shows. So these needs collide in terms of the business and the market and the excuse me, business sector and markets, but they also collide like that for us as individuals in terms of our needs. So that was one major thing. How do we help young people recognize the, the way that the world really works internally and externally, and how do we support them with income for that? Can you hit the next slide for me real quick? Oh, I have it. Look at that. So the other thing we got into here is that nuances matter. Identity matters. And identity is not just race-based, right? But, it, but that matters, right? Identity is through culture that includes youth culture, right? I uh, appreciated everything Marquis said for those that were here in the last session. Young people can get ignored and trampled on and spoken for all the time. Women, same kind of deal, right? And as a man, I never have to size up a room the way a woman does. And that's something that I had to come into a consciousness of, an intentional consciousness of, to start really supporting women in boardrooms and echoing what they said. When I see and notice that, oh, she put out a great idea, or even if the idea wasn't that great, because sometimes humans just don't put out great ideas, I can still understand score her so we can at least put it on the table to be considered because she's worth that, right? So all these ways that identity matters, we've got to think about that in the context of this last slide as well when we're thinking about people's lived experiences and what they bring in the room in terms of need, but also in how we're designing for the future and how entrepreneurship can help. It's not going to solve everything. I'm going to put that out there. Capitalism is not going to solve everything. All right, capitalism is one of the reasons why philanthropy is completely not fair and not equitable, and we've got to be honest about that. Um, the other thing, the future of work. This is a huge concern for me. It is where I park out a lot of my personal business um, in terms of my own economic and entrepreneurial pursuits. I work on this issue a lot. Bringing the human sciences to bear in the context of a workforce development construct for the future is a huge issue. The issue of skill development is big because as technology is continually replacing remedial work, wages and as wages continue to go down, one of the things that surefire, sure proof, we don't have to overthink is that human skills are, let me qualify them, human skills are creativity, problem solving, complex communication and conflict management slash resolution. These are things that robots are not gonna be able to do. Automation cannot do, at least as of yet. We're, we're decades away from it being that sophisticated. So you still need humans, and really what it's about is how well can a human being partner with AI, artificial intelligence, how well can humans partner with augmented reality and virtual reality? How well can humans partner with automation to actually solve complex challenges that we could not solve before? Well, one of the first ways to do that is for us and our thinking, you gotta steep kids, young people, I shouldn't call you kids, sorry, Chloe. Steeping young people in spaces and places where they're learning about human-centered design, learning about user-centered design, they're learning about how to assess for complex problems in the world, but they're also navigating, I wish this was a little bit bigger, I apologize, I'll send these to anyone that wants to look at them, uh, navigating the development of skill sets through practice. Because the most fascinating thing to me is we've lost this understanding as human beings that we've learned through modeling way before we learned through functionally quote unquote literate ways. Right? There's this idea that a kindergartner showing up with no index of skills. That's the most foolish thing as a species that we could ever think of. They have five years of practice of communicating non-verbally at that before the verbal things came online. They've developed a sense of morality. They have a working sense of judgment that's going to continue to be 
uh, informed and refined over time, so the experiences that they're embedded in really matter from a practice model for those reasons, particularly when we're talking about the index of skills that are, again, pretty foolproof for the developing and shifting economy that is here now. The economy has already shifted and is going to continue shifting, and we have to pay attention to that. This is where the world of creatives, not just musicians, we have to stop teaching young people that they're just musicians. They're learning things through practice in groups and individually that are behavioral skill sets that can transcend any sector. Thank you. So here's the deal. The slide here on the, your left, I'm making sure my directionality is right is a list of skill sets that through 25 years of some uh, qualitative research was put together to display what had been discovered around character traits and what the researchers call leadership domains that help create successful entrepreneurs and CEOs. So there's things up there like a lack of a fear of failure, um, work ethic, on the flip side, you have 50 years worth of research from a field called positive psychology. Positive psychology, not positive thinking, but the inverse of our traditional approach to psychology, which is pathology, which is basically pathology, what's wrong with a human and how do we fix it? This looks at, well, what skill sets buffer the deterioration of someone's mental health? It was fascinating to me that these lists were identical. Now they have two inherent challenges, and that with this I'm done. One. How do you measure work ethic? That is so subjective. And as if it's, and they talk about it as if it's one codified thing. That's really subjective, right? Courage, let's jump to another one on here. Courage, courage isn't a skill set. In fact, the literature now calls it a character virtue. It's one of the terms being used. So measuring growth of courage is pretty hard particularly when you start to talk about identity and you talk about nuances of people's experiences, courage can look so different student to student. So what we tried to do was develop environments where no matter where that young person was at, we could meet them there and push. So courage looked different for Claire and Chloe than it did for another group, but we built an environment where we were always kind of pulling you along, pushing you along, putting a challenge in front of you, and supporting you and closing the gap to get there. It's better that we assess the environment for courage, building opportunities, than to try to assess a child with a survey tool to go, did you grow courage, yes or no? <laughs> One through five. <laughs> Likert scale. Two, these are too nuanced. So that's part of our thinking and what went into how we design this course. It was very practice-based. Thank you. So we're really excited about this work. As you can see, this is no cute program. <laughs> and uh, we've spent a lot of time in developing uh, our curriculum. Um, we are, we've partnered with the University of Pennsylvania in uh, helping us with our assessment and our assessment tools. Uh, we're excited about the program we have developed, and we really think we, we're uh, using uh, some really incredible techniques to work with our young people. I want to end by saying music is the tool. Could the tool be something else? Sure. But I play the double bass, and music is a tool. And I think it's a huge opportunity for all of our large institutions, large and small, who are in the music space particularly those in classical saying, we were, help us, help. I mean, <laughs> particularly those who are in the classical music space, this is an opportunity of ways we can reach young people and invite them into music, um, invite them into the conversation. Then, through organizations like PME and these collectives, we can send them on to the next appropriate organizations to help them with any of the musical needs that they, that they could ever want. And we're very fortunate to have something like PMA in Philadelphia to help us with that. So in youth orchestras, most of the kids, I mean, I think a lot of us know this, aren't going to become professional musicians. And that's OK. The skills we are providing our students, they can become anything they want to be. And they'll be really good at it. And, music <laughs> and hopefully, I'm going to be honest, this might sound challenging. Hopefully, they all don't become musicians. 
I, I, we need, we have some complex problems that Chloe's generation is going to have to solve, and we can play music all we want as we burn up or freeze to death. <laughs> so we're going to have to figure this out. <laughs> This also just turns the whole narrative on its head. It's not why is music important, it's that it is what is creating everything that is important. Um, and so with that, we'd love to answer any questions. And we also have Slido, of course, as all the other presentations here at Spinx. So if you want to um, ask any questions, I'm monitoring it here. Um, but if anybody has any questions for the microphone, happy to answer in the next bunch of minutes. Um, <laughs> we have a good 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Taylor Lockwood. I'm from the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra. I think what you guys are doing is like actually amazing. Um, Cause I also believe that Gen Z not only like is going to have to save the world, but probably is going to be the generation that has the strength and the courage and the brilliance to do it. Um, so kind of talking about Gen Z, how do you get older generations to take their work seriously so that beyond Project 440, they can continue to get funding and so they're not like, the cute kids, look what they're doing, that they can continue to push against the barrier and then move past the initial $500. I think the simplest answer and quickest is that Joe said something last session, which I really loved, because it, it, it challenges the notion of empowerment because we will have conferences about empowerment, and I'm going to hold diatribe about this, instead of sharing power. So Joe shares his network, and I've watched it over and over again. Susanna, same thing. That's one of the things I think as board members we love, is like we are all dumping our networks in here, not just to raise money for the org, but really to provide opportunities for these young folks to really not just start an idea and learn entrepreneurship, but like seed that thing and let's get it moving. And if that's not it, it's okay for it to iterate into something else. But I think that's part of how we validate young people is like, it's the same with going to that boardroom example of like, if I know I'm a man and I know a woman might get railroaded, it's my job to support, right? Not even talk for her, but just support it, lift it up and give that space. I also wanna say that as you know, part of what we're teaching the students, it's a lot of self-evaluation. So figuring out what you do have. If you're no longer a cute kid, what are your strengths, you know? Um, and so f figuring out for yourself what those strengths are and then understanding how to use those to capitalize in a way that's appropriate, making sure, you know, that the kind of, the not overstepping what the social construct is with uh, philanthropy. Thanks. I just have a really quick question. Um, when is this going national and going to be in every state? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> um, we are uh, actually, the residency program that we've created is our first way of, of reaching out uh, so people can get a taste of our work. While we're doing that, we are, um, and Susanna can speak to this uh, maybe afterwards, but we are taking that uh, 30, uh, 30 session curriculum, figuring out how we can package that uh, through training teachers with all this great knowledge and information. Uh, and then um, what might this look like in the classroom? Because if there is a way to keep music education in school, if the kids are learning how to play a recorder, that's one thing, but if they're learning how to become better people through music, that's another. And that's the narrative we wanna, so we're working on it, thanks. I am Candea Shepard from the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra Orchids Program. Um, my question is, where do you feel like higher ed institutions have an opportunity to continue to work what you're doing? So, for instance, myself, I went to Berkeley. I knew I did not play a traditional instrument, but I made a conscientious decision to study music business management as my, my thing. Where do you feel like the higher ed institutions have the responsibility to pick up that baton and continue that work? I mean, 
I think they have <laughs> all of the responsibility. Um, but I think that we can't expect anything to change until the uh, request is there. And that's one of the reasons that we're really concentrating on the high school musicians, because if these high school students already have the interest and the skill sets, they're gonna be going to college expecting that it's there. And if it's not, they will demand it. Um, so instead of kind of trying to knock on the doors of administrators, we're trying to get the uh, from the other end. And, and briefly, I'll say, I think the market is gonna have something to say about this over the next 10 years. Some of these models are just not sustainable. Large orchestras are just not producing the revenue. It's a hard conversation. Nobody wants to talk about it, but it's real. And that inequity and philanthropy is a whole thing. So organizations are going to have to reimagine themselves in the future if they want a, a base of students to be involved. And what I do with young people is go like, hey, you say you hate classical music, right? Watch a movie with no sound. And then they're like, oh, OK, well, wait a minute. I guess I do like it, I just don't want to go to the concert hall. So I think schools need to be thinking, what is music publishing like, and blah, 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 or just business in general. Hey there, my name's Danielle, and I'm also from Org Kids, like my two colleagues before me. Um, and kind of to piggyback off of Camille's question, and I wonder if this is an entrepreneurial um, opportunity for the students. Um, to produce those materials that could be shared. At Org Kids, we offer some professional development sessions. And in my experience doing it this year, the kids were really kind of resistant to me as an adult, you know, offering this mm -hmm. advice about the future and auditions and applications. And then when I would have some videos with younger people speaking, it kind of, you know, like was more relatable. So I'm wondering if there's any way that people who have gone through your program, the students can share ideas, yeah, <laughs> can share ideas and, you know, then programs like ours could pay yeah. for this kind of learning experience. That's a great thank idea you. and I'll definitely bring it up in our next staff meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank and you. And I'll so bring much. it up to the board, I took a note. We have, two we have two students right here who I think would have great interest in going to Baltimore and encouraging your students. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a question from Slido that says, um, how do your, I, this says, how do your founders respond to paying students in the Doing Good program? I wonder if the person meant funders. I'm not positive. Um, but regardless, I'll let you answer that on either side of that word. Yeah. I received, well, I mean, personally, I've received um, two reactions. And after I explained it to them, then they joined the light, uh, come to the light. Uh, but one reaction is like, you shouldn't have to pay kids for this. And actually, that kind of makes me mad. You shouldn't have to pay kids for this. They should just know. They should know to come to think this is important. Uh, and this is going to what uh, Michael was speaking about. If the students don't know, what, if the students don't know, they don't. They may not literally necessarily know what opportunity is or what it looks like. Um, so that's one. Two, the equity piece. Why on earth, <laughs> uh, if the kid is, sac I mean, already sacrificing for home? taking time from uh, homework uh, uh, to work and uh, for their families, why on earth should we then expect them to come to our program? We're giving them really important things, but how can we not honor them for that sacrifice um, in, in learning? And so um, uh, those two things put together makes it a, a very easy, well, sell for me at least, <laughs> um, that we compensate our students for being in our program because um, we are taking their time. And some of them, I'll be honest, some of them are really doubtful about what we're doing. They're like, oh, is this something we can, um, uh, um, is this, are we, am I really gonna learn something in this program? And uh, if it's a little, if it is a carrot, I'll use that as a carrot too. So, three reasons. <laughs> I want to also, uh, I was going to end with this later, but I'll, I'll just share the story now. We um, presented, uh, Joe and I went to South Philly High, which is actually the, the school where we are housing the program. Students come from all over, city, all over the city after school on Thursdays to South Philly High. So we're explaining the program to the South Philly High music students, and this one kid raises his hand and he says, that's fine, but what's the catch? <laughs> and we were both kind of, well, actually he said, I don't mean any disrespect, <laughs> but what's the catch? <laughs> um, and we were both a little bit taken aback, but we both really remembered the story. Um, 
and he ended up signing up for the program. <laughs> and he's um, now one of the students that's meeting with our board members and figuring out what he can do next. Um, he wasn't planning on going to college, but now he's applying for the Community College of Philadelphia. Um, so, you know, it's just one story, um, but that, that funding allowed him, or it was probably the carrot, it was the catch, right? Like, it was what made him come, um, and then it, it made a huge difference. Hello, I'm Leslie Dunner from the Interlochen Arts Academy. What is the best way for us to gain access to your research and for interfacing with you for implementation and then to share that information and implementation with our respective high school colleagues? Joe is brimming right now. I just wanna, <laughs> <laughs> he is so excited. Because I think I'm the board member for two years, like not yet, you gotta keep cooking. One of the things that we struggle with is how to scale responsibly. We're a very small organization. Can I be honest about how big? Okay, we have one full-time member that is not, one full-time staff that is not me. I'm part-time. Joe's even less part-time, <laughs> although I'm sure he puts way more of his time into it, right? Um, but we want to make sure that we're scaling responsibly. And so where we are right now on that is the residency model. We absolutely want to get the full version to as many places around the country. And Joe wants to take over the world. Um, <laughs> so I, I mean, I, is I, February I, the time for that then? Uh, <laughs> absolutely. February sounds great. <laughs> it's the first. 2020. I would say I, I would be I would be I would not be a a a, a, a respected executive director or um, in this case fundraiser without saying if you know no folks who can help us out <laughs> with resources we can have that conversation too uh, because we are definitely looking to grow. I'll say this too, just because we're here, there is there are models for what's called like a multi-client study. So if there are people who would want to come together and talk with us about what it might be like to pool some resources together to look at developing a model that could be implemented where we're not having to be there for 30 straight weeks. There are methods to funding to get to scale that like pharmaceutical companies do that stuff all the time, right? So there are frameworks that we could be borrowing in the not-for-profit sector that we just have to be thoughtful of. Well, that's one. The other is when you say research, if you were referring to like some of the like ideology behind it, that can be shared. Those are articles. I can share that kind of stuff with you. That's not what you want. Okay, cool. I didn't know what you meant by research. That's what I wanted to be clear. I was like, what's that? Um, we only have five more minutes, so I, I'm going to close up, but I do have one more Slido question. Um, the Michael, is for you. Uh, you mentioned a critique of capitalism. Can you say more, and how does this context affect your work? <laughs> oh, my God. Who, who did it? Anonymous go uh, Of course, of course, of course. So, I mean, let's be real, right? At the end of the day, consumerism has not been responsible. We've scaled at massive levels. Wall Street did not look like this in the 60s. It's actually in the 70s that that stuff happened. Uh, and so, you know, our population, here's another one. We crossed the one billion mark planet-wide or globally back in the 70s. We're now at like 7.6 to 7.8 billion. That is massive growth. We have no idea how to exist on this planet together in that kind of a voluminous state. And we just have to be honest about it. In America, we have some things we have to answer for on a national stage. This is gonna sound really intense. You can cut the camera off on me, I'm not offended. We have to start thinking about the fact that this phone didn't just cost a couple of dollars. And this is why my phone's a little broke on the side, I can't see it up here. But I'm refusing to buy a new one at the moment because I'm doing a lot of research around like, how can I get a phone that's just sourced a little more humanely? I was reading, you know, back a couple of years ago, reading about the working conditions of folks making our phones and there's nets at the bottom of the building. That's just because people were jumping off. Fox, uh, was it Foxcore, Foxconn? Don't quote me on the name. It's more than Googleable because there was a move in the Western world to be like, well, you gotta source better, Apple. And Apple's like, well, this is hard stuff. You want, you, if you want what you want, this is how we source it. Unless you can come up with something better. So we have these like inherent issues that are at conflict with each other and just the nature of our humanity in America at least being built around consumerism that's not necessarily responsible and it's not being researched fully and communicated outward in a way that allows us to make 
those kinds of conscious decisions. So that's what I mean when I say that, because you can take that kind of a framework, apply it to philanthropy, apply it to a lot of other things. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm probably not getting invited back, but thanks. We have just one minute, so I'll let Joe close with any final thoughts. Sure, no, I, we, I said music as a tool a number of times, uh, but one of the things I wanna make sure I stress, and this is why, personally, I'm invested in this work, is music as a tool for service. Getting young people to think two, two ways. One, outside of themselves, and they can look at their community and say, how can I be of service in this world? And then the second thing, giving them the agency to be able to make that change. That, to me, makes me excited about our future. Uh, that makes me excited about the future of music. It makes me excited even though I'm, um, uh, uh, I might still technically be part-time. This is a, a lot of my life. <laughs> this is a whole lot of my life. And, uh, but I think it's, it's an opportunity for the industry just to, just to think differently about how we work with our um, young people in, in our different communities um, and how we invite them into our space. Um, and uh, yeah, in a way that's, that's, that's warm and welcoming. So um, um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you so much for coming today. If you would like to find out more information, it is up here. And we will, of course, we'll be happy to speak with each and every one of you um, uh, as we close up this session. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful thank rest you. of your conference.